Hello everybody, welcome back. I'm the Strategy Professor and today we're going to be looking at the 7.20 uh, support tier list and patch notes. So if you're new to the channel, you can always access this Google Doc I'm going to be going over in the description. You can also find timestamps. You can jump around your favorite parts. Uh, as usual, first off, we're going to go over the patch notes and then we're going to go over sort of the top five for each role and then the top supports. Okay, so let's go ahead and get in here. Um, Eve... Interesting changes. Uh, I don't think she's going to matter that much. People are going to try to make her a thing, you know, in the first week or so. But I think she does have a lot of problems. She does do quite a bit of damage, but it requires a lot of prep. And champions that require a lot of prep um, often have some issues. Now, one of the major problems that they have sort of introduced with her is she has no defense. So she's going to have a really, really hard time in team fights. Um figuring out what to do. So she has assassination, but she has pretty limited mobility also. So I believe her old W, she used to just get a straight like burst of speed um, whenever she did it. I guess I can look at the history here. That's like her really old stuff. Um, I think that's still the same thing, though. Yeah, I mean, it's it was something like this. It may have changed it a little bit, but... Um, yeah, it used to give her a huge burst of speed uh, for three seconds, and she was ghosted, and then it was... Every time she damages someone, she got a cooldown. So anyway, this was her gap closer. So when she was coming up for a gank, she could sneak up on people, pop W, um, and then just run up. Okay. Oh, that was the super old one. Yeah, and it still had the same graphics. Wow, I remember that. It was like a million years ago. Um, but yeah, so that used to give her a gap closer. So she used to actually be able to run up and get on people. Now, if you look at her, she doesn't have that. And another thing is her ult gave her a huge shield. Um, like a really big shield. So if she hit, you know, two or three people, if she hit three people, she get a 900 person shield. So that was huge. And it lasted for six seconds. Um... So yeah, that actually gave her the ability to run up in a team fight and start the fight. Um, and it was based on current health. So her, you know, sh her position was as a flanker, you know, she would run up, start the fight, hit the back line, hit two or three people, um, and then just do a lot of damage. And then if she had to, she could pop W and run out. Also. So she had this position as like early game, premier... Um, sort of stealthy ganker that could catch people off guard who don't buy pink wards and overextended lanes. So she had that, and then she also had kind of this late game transition into a flanker initiator. Um, now, great, granted, she wasn't the greatest flanking initiator, but at least that's something she could do late game. Now she doesn't have that, and she doesn't have the early invisibility either. I mean, one of the signature things about Eve that distinguished her from other sort of early game aggression junglers is that you couldn't see her. Especially in, uh, you know, Golden Lower Elo, where people don't buy pink wards hardly ever, except for the support, um, and they don't ward the proper areas for her. So you had to ward her camps, you had to buy pink wards, you had to have a specialized game plan in mind. You had to always be scared of her, because she could be anywhere. So it made you play the game different, or else you paid the price, right? And so she just kind of forced this extra game knowledge, extra sort of attention to macro... Um, on the enemy team, and most people, you know, against good Evelyns at various points throughout history, when she has been strong with her abilities, um, that was her signature thing, is that she was early game just a complete menace, and she could snowball, um, and then transition to that uh, later game team fighting powerhouse. Because she doesn't, like, she can't really split push that well. I mean, she can with her Q. Like, she can kind of wave clear, but she can't really 1v1 people. She has to run away if anyone shows up, if they see her. A lot of times. So these these are the problems. Is they, they've removed her team fighting capabilities. They've removed her early game stealth. Uh, they've removed her defense. They've removed a lot of her mobility. So in exchange, they've just given her a lot of damage, which is nice. But once again, it requires a lot of prep. So yeah, in the rosiest of scenarios, you'll max your Q. Um, you know, you hit somebody with your dart. You have to skill shot hit them with something to lock on now. Um, and then you get to do, you know, some extra damage. So that's 195 damage. Um, plus 135, that's, uh, what, 340 with a, um, like 205 AP ratio, 195, yeah, 195 AP ratio, so that all sounds really good, it's like, wow, that's a lot of damage, 
And it is if you stick all of that to people, but you have to stay on them and they have to not like get away from you. Yeah, there's nothing that's a slow here in her kit. This could be a slow if you hit him with the allure. That's not the same as a speed up to get close enough to do this. That yeah, slows them by 65%. Now, that slow might last for up to five seconds. Uh, okay, so, I mean, she could get a slow, like, it seems like the slow could be up to five seconds for 65%. It doesn't say it's decaying, so that could actually be pretty, uh, pretty good if she gets close enough to do it. Um... But you have to hit him with an ability or a basic attack. I mean, I guess if you allure and then hit him with your uh, your Q. Yeah, and it's a skill shot. If you, you know, allure and then hit him with your Q, if that does slow him by 65% for 5 seconds, which is how this seems like it works. Um, Oh, no, the disable duration. Okay, never mind, never mind. So they're charmed for 5 seconds. You have 5 seconds to trigger, and it would only last for, you know, X amount of seconds up to, you know, 1 to 1 and a half seconds. Okay. So it'd only be slowed for 65 seconds. Okay. Um, so if you wait the 2 and a half seconds, then you get a charm instead of a slow. Gotcha. But that's a lot of time to wait. I mean, you have to charm them. They have 2 and a half seconds. That's like 1, 2, you know, before you can do before you can get the charm on them. That is so much time for the enemy to react. Like, they can use their mobility and, you know, potentially get away from you. Um, it's just such a telegraph. I wish it was, like, one and a half seconds. I, I do like some kind of uh, timing on that, some kind of awareness window, but that's just, that's so much. Because she doesn't have a gap closer. If it was, like, after two and a half seconds, she can launch herself at the target, like, Rengar-esque or something like that. Um... You know, she could launch herself at the target for 700 range or whatever. She could dive in there. Like, that might be a little bit better. But as it is right now, she has no way to gap close. And they're just going to be like, oh, Eve's here. And then they're just going to, like, you know, disengage. So, it's okay. This is relatively weak. I mean, she whips the target. Has a very short range. So, once again, you have to get in really close. Um... And this gives you 30% bonus movement speed for two seconds. So this is how she gets her movement speed. But the problem is you have to get in really close. It doesn't help you gap close. It just helps you stick a little bit once you're in a fight. It has an eight second cooldown. So you're not going to be like spamming this that much. Um, so it can do it. Now this does damage all enemies that it passes through. And so does this. So if people are really tightly packed in like a Jarvan ult. Or they're being stunned by Kennen. Or they're just grouped up in the same place for some reason in the jungle, then you can do pretty good, like, area of effect damage. Um, but, yeah, that's just not enough. I mean, 140 for this much prep? Like, you have to get in that close. Like, really close. Gaining Demon Shade resets Whiplash's cooldown and empowers the next cast. Huh. Wait, how would she regain Demon Shade? So you could do this and then walk out of combat for four seconds and then that would reset the cooldown and you could go back in. So you, you, like, you could like, have a harassment pattern where you go invisible and then you walk up. What's the detection range on this? I mean, if there is no detection range, now it says she's camouflaged, kind of like Twitch, but Twitch has a detection range, so I don't know what her detection range is. If she doesn't have a detection range, if it's just straight up she's invisible until she hits you, like, that might actually be, like, pretty decent as, like, a laning Eve if you want to. You could just, like, go into a bush, go invisible, and then just get free hits on people if you get to dive at them with, like, EQ and then just rotate through, so. But if she has a detection range, kind of like Twitch, where they can see her coming... 
That could be a problem. Now, it says she dashes towards the enemy. So I don't know how far that dash is. If it's only 225 for the dash, um, is it going to show me how? That's just random stuff. Okay, so I don't know the dash range. If it's a decent dash range, if it's like 500 or something, then, uh, you know, maybe that could work as a gap closer. Maybe. Um, deals a little, that's still pretty low damage. But it would be a gap closer, and it would give her that 30% sticking power. So a lot of it hinges on how far this dash is. If the dash is only 225, it's not going to matter that much. If it's like 500, it's pretty good. Okay, so if she comes up stealthed on people, she charms them, and then she gets to dash forward with her whiplash. Maybe that's good. I haven't watched a lot of the PvE. I've watched a little bit when she first came out just to kind of see what was going on, but... Okay, her active. So she becomes untargetable so she can dodge skill shots, reveals her true form to all enemies, and then blinks backward 400 units. Um... And they take a lot of damage, a decent amount of damage, and if they're lower than 30, it's a pretty strong execute if they're under 30% of their health. So this is going to be overkill on a lot of squishy targets, but it's pretty good. I don't like that it has 140 second cooldown. This feel, like she's an assassin that seems like she's really dependent on this as part of her rotation to kill people. So I feel like this should be 120 seconds or so. I don't think it's that overpowered it requires prep like you know to get the maximum amount out of this it doesn't have any cc on it um it doesn't have any gap closers on it, it has a backwards like blinking effect it it's really close range like this to me seems like something that should be like 120 seconds or less it doesn't seem like it's threatening enough to where you have to make it 140 seconds and it seems like it's very integral to her damage rotation when she assassinates people so I think 140 is a bit much. So overall, like, the verdict is it looks like she does pretty good damage. They did give her a piece of crowd control in the kit that is delayed, like, hard crowd control, you know, for two seconds. So that will help her out with the gank. A lot of it's going to depend on whether or not Whiplash, um, you know, how big that gap closer is. But my initial instinct is I'm just not sure where she's going to fit into the meta now. I'm not sure that she has a very unique role that she can fill. She does do AP damage, um... But the fact that she doesn't get her invisibility till 6 is also really rough. Um, I just don't know. Like, if you want, like, early game domination with magic damage, you would probably just play Elise. Um, by the time she can become invisible, that's going to give people time to get pink wards, and it's going to give the time for the support to get a sight stone and, like, potentially ward deeper in your camps. Um, she's still going to have a really hard time sieging. Uh, she's going to have a really hard time taking dragons and baron because she's not going to be tanky and she doesn't have any percentage health damage. Um, her clear is not going to be very healthy, most likely. Maybe she does enough damage to keep it healthy, but uh, I, I, I don't get it. I just think there are better early game junglers, think there are better mid game junglers and late game junglers. And I'm just not really sure where she's going to fit into the hierarchy. Like, it's a cool kit, it's cool ideas. I like it, but. I think that she needs um, she needs a gap closer. She needs a more reliable gap closer, and she needs some kind of defense. Like, maybe if she charms somebody, then she gets the shield. Or they could just keep the shield on her ult. Or um, give her resets. Like, champions that don't have defense, that are, like, decent assassins, they have resets. So that, that gives them a purpose. When they assassinate people, they can go off in teamfights. So, you know, if you're thinking of something like Katarina, Akali, those champions don't even see that much play, and they have pretty decent gap closers and, like, you know, okay mobility, and they get resets, and they do a lot of damage, and they still don't see that much play um, by the vast majority of the population. So Eve's kind of like that. She just doesn't get resets on anything. Um, or, like, Master Yi. If you want to think of Master Yi as someone who's just, like, you know, telegraphed, um, just lots of damage, but then he can get resets and team fights to do more things. So I just think that she just doesn't stand up to these other high scaling, like damage type of champions because she doesn't have reliable gap closers. Her objective um, control is very weak with towers, bear, and dragon. Her wave clear is probably suspicious. Her early game ganks are suspicious. She doesn't have a lot of mobility or gap closers. I just, I don't. She's okay. She looks really cool. I mean, maybe she'll get seen as a laner. 
So, you know, a lot of this is going to depend, and I would have to see this in action more on a couple of things. Like I said, the number one big one is how far is this jump when she comes out invisible, and what's the detection range on her demon shade? Can she just literally walk right up to people and open on them, and they won't see her unless they have um, a ward? Or, uh, Okay, no, all camouflage champions are 700. So it's not just Twitch. He's just one of the only ones that has camouflage. Okay, so it's like Twitch and Rengar are camouflage. Um, temporary revealed within 700 units of a champion. So she can't touch him with anything. I guess she could, uh, I mean, she could throw her hate spike at a distance and hit him before they see her, potentially. Okay, so she could open on him. So she could cast a lore from a long ways away. I mean, you could fake people with this too. That's a really long range. Like you could fake, like put it on one person and then rotate to another lane while they're scared. Like they'll say, Eve's there, Eve's there. And then run and then maybe you could go to another lane. I don't know. It gives you a long time. So like maybe you could allure and then uh, hit them with a hake spite from a distance before you reveal yourself. Because this does outrange. Um, the reveal radius. This does not. So you definitely have to hit him with that skill shot to make this worth it. And then you'd get the charm, and then you get to go in and mess with him. So she's interesting. I think people will try her. She might be better than I think. I mean, it's all going to depend on just how much like damage does she do. It's just really hard to think of someone who's going to do more than like Elise early on, or someone who's going to you know have the same kind of burst and utility as someone like Jarvan uh, later on. So we'll see. I think she's overall going to have a hard time finding a home in metas, but I mean, maybe she'll be a really good early game snowballer. It's just, it's a really big deal that she's not invisible until six now. And obviously she can get bullied out really hard in the jungle at higher elos, you know, Jarvan or Ezreal, Elise, Leeson, anyone invades her, she's done probably. Okay. Uh, how are we looking on time? More than I wanted, but I, you know, I want to pay a little bit of time because that was a rework. Brand doesn't matter. Um, you know, he does get some mana back if you kill people or if you kill minions while they're ablaze, but that's not going to be enough mana to make a big enough deal. I don't think that's going to give him a little bit more wave clear, but it's not going to help him with his harass patterns. And he still is very, um, very squishy, no gap closers, extremely skill shot dependent. If anyone outplays your uh, fireball on your Q, then you're worthless. Um, so, I mean, he's pretty good as sort of a solution to um, tanks bot lane if you just want a lot of AP damage. He's pretty decent like against Tom Kench, Braum, um, Nautilus, Alistar, because you can stun him and then full combo him, and it does a lot of damage. So, he's okay. I think he's still a lot better support, and this doesn't help him as mid lane. His scaling is also not that great with AP in the mid lane. Like, his highest point is when he gets Sork Boots haunting guys. That's when he kind of... Uh, sort of um power spikes the hardest because his ap ratios are really low um overall like most of his damage comes from his percentage health his percent max health off of his passive damage that he does so he's okay i, I don't think this is going to make him viable in the mid lane again and obviously it's not going to make that much of a difference in support because you're not going to be killing on a minion so i don't think that's going to change the pecking order too much with brand uh graves relatively irrelevant um you know, the problem with Graves, this does give you a little bit more bonus attack damage early on. Um, but, and it, this does help him a little bit with a clear marginally. But that's not his problem. Like, Graves' problem is he just gets outclassed by other early game champions. Um, now, and he's kind of a victim of itemization to an extent. We call him a victim. He had his time in the sun. He was extremely oppressive and powerful for, like, half of the season you know from like 7-1 maybe even earlier than that up to like 7-8 or 7-9 until they nerfed him he's been very very powerful so um the thing that really did him in was the um the nerf to black cleaver earlier on so he doesn't get as much shred and then his they changed his damage from total attack damage to bonus attack damage and that's really bad because that 
that just cripples them as an early game powerhouse. He has to build more AD. And a lot of people will say, oh, that's fine. You just have to get a few more items. No, almost every champion they do that to where they change it from total to bonus is typically really bad. It depends on how high the base damage is on the ability. But usually that's really bad. And it's kind of a nail in the coffin. If you think of Fizz, if you think of um, Graves, if you think of Kennen, um, any of these champions where they've changed it to bonus attack damage is really really harsh unless the base damage is already really high on the ability the only champion where i think that's been successfully done without completely crippling them in recent memory is caitlin uh they changed her traps to be based on i think bonus damage um rather than total ad but they gave the traps like 60 extra base damage or something they just it like insanely boosted the traps base damage so that was why that ended up working out okay yeah um okay so this is the buff just kind of the history of grace if you're wondering why did he fall out of the meta what happened uh this is what happened okay um so the first ad hit they increased well they they slapped the base damages here they didn't change it from total to bonus they just slapped the bases okay so in six eight they made it that when did they change it to bonus yeah, because that's a total AD in the past. Eventually, they changed it to bonus AD somewhere in here. It looks like it's not documented, unless this is the change. No, it was bonus AD right there. I don't know. But anyways, this was the nail in the coffin, was the 710. They reduced the damage on his Q by a lot. Um, so the first hit damage was reduced to 100 from 115. It get a it got a bigger ratio. It's like, whatever, okay, it doesn't matter. The second hit got reduced from 200 or 260 to 200 though, which is astronomical. And they increased the the bonus AD. It doesn't matter. They just sh they just slaughtered the base damage, um, and they increased the cooldown. 120 still fair, but this was really big. And then they uh, took away his free magic resist in 7 7, which didn't make a huge deal, but it was okay. And the other big changes were, like I said, Cleaver and Lethality. He's a great Lethality user. He loves the Dusk Blade, and he was a major abuser of that. And he was the number one jungler for a long time. He was like right there with Rengar, uh, Kha'Zix, and Graves. That was, you know, the top three junglers for, you know, the first third of the season or so. So this doesn't change any of that. It doesn't bring Lethality back. It doesn't bring Cleaver back. It doesn't give him his base stats back. Um, it just gives him a little bit more bonus AD, which is not going to matter early game, and that's what he is. He's primarily an early game bully. He does scale okay with later game items, but he gets massacred by tanks. He doesn't offer any crowd control or utility. He's just pure damage, and a lot of it is you know, based on his early game aggression and his ability to get ahead early and bully people, and he just can't do that right now. I mean, Ezreal will crush him in the jungle um jarvan even kha'zix will beat him in the jungle i've been seeing a lot more kha'zix lately um kha'zix will take him out at least just everybody can bully him out early so it just it just doesn't do enough this doesn't make up for the massive amount of damage that they took off of him i mean taking 60 off of a uh, an ability that was a 260 base that's like a reduction of like i don't know 22 or 23 percent damage so this is this is not gonna matter that much and his itemization it like he really needs to get cleaver early on and that thing just does not have they've nerfed black cleaver like 50 times uh i'll show you what i'm talking about here really quick and we'll move on this is relevant for some other champions also but this item right here has been one of the most like controversial but like overpowered items of all time that's been nerfed so many times and when it came out it was like league of cleaver everyone was uh, getting cleaver so this is the one they did in seven nine and this was really what i mean that nerf to graves was big but this cleaver nerf was even bigger so the damage per stack was taken down to four percent from five percent and the max was only 24 percent shred which is a big deal um and then they knocked the ad down in seven four from uh 50 to 40 which is huge it's 20 percent less ad on the item yeah it gets health it doesn't matter that's it's okay i guess but it hurt champions like graves like kha'zix like rengar all these people that liked cleaver um and then it was reduced here the total cost was reduced but they also took down um 
5 uh, AD. So 5 AD is worth like 150 gold. So that was actually a pretty good buff for it in 6.9. Um, and then even before that, they've just nerfed it a lot. Anyways, yeah, they've uh, they've tinkered with that item quite a lot over the years. And so that that's the problem with Graves. He's not coming back as the bottom line. Okay, Karma, very small buff. Um, this doesn't fix Karma's problem either. Like, they're tinkering with these champions in ways that just don't matter. Like, they don't... This, this is like the chat. This is like the most inconsequential patch we've had all season. Um, you know, they're tinkering with champions that don't fix their core problems. With the exception of Ornn. Ornn is a big deal. We'll talk about Ornn in a second. Um, but most of these champions, as you saw with Bran, that doesn't fix his big problems. Ev Evelyn doesn't fix her problems while she hasn't been seen in the meta. Um, Graves doesn't fix it, and Karma's not going to fix it either. So... Karma is picked historically. She hasn't been a premier support for a lot of League's history, but she was last fall and for a decent chunk of last year. Probably the first half of last or the back half of last year. And then this year, um, sort of early on, she was good. And it was kind of just like a Karma Zyro meta. And why people were playing that was it was just you just pushed as hard as you could and you tried to poke and do as much damage as you could early on. And Karma's very good at that. The fact that she gets her ult level 1 does a huge amount of damage. Um, and she's just a great early game bully. Who just happened to scale decently well later into the game also with her team fight utility, your ability to mantra your whole team with your um, shield and then you know, just your ability to kind of spam stuff and do some decent poke damage. But you primarily picked her because she was, you know, the premier early game bully. And that's that was her whole role. Well, this doesn't affect that. So your mantra cooldown... Um, okay, so it goes from, what, two seconds per enemy champion hit... To two, three, four. Okay, so she gets one more second at the end, and then an extra half second for basic attacks. It does absolutely nothing to her early game. That's the exact same. But now, you know, really late into the game, so around, I think, is that level 11 or 16? I can't remember, but either way, like, in the mid to the late game, she will get a little bit more spells in her rotation. Uh, but it doesn't help her early game. So, the big problem with Karma... Uh, if we want to look her up really quickly. The big issue with Karma is Doran Shield, first of all. Now, they did nerf Doran Shield. Not as many people are getting it. Um, Targons, which people are getting now, is a problem, too, because that gives healing to both people in lane. Um, and just the presence of en other Enchanter supports that have heals, like Sona, Nami. Um, the nerf to Janna does help her, because now she can actually stick damage on Janna in the lane. Um... She's not a great coin user. She really prefers spell thieves because she doesn't scale as well as other supports. And the reason is her shield, the base values are really low. 170 is just disgustingly low for an enchanter. And it only has a 0.5 AP ratio and it doesn't add any extra bonuses. It gives you a little bit of extra healing, but it doesn't give you picks and that on hit damage on your AD carry like Lulu does. And it doesn't give you the AD from a Janna shield. So, um... You know, it's okay, but it's just, it's a lot weaker. It's a lot weaker than other people. She doesn't have hard CC. All that she has is this Focus Resolve, which is a delayed, um, like, a delayed snare. But they have to stick, this has to stick to them for two seconds before you get the snare. So it's a decent snare, but this is one of the, like, this is the last thing you level up. And so, for most of the game, it's just a one second route that you have to... Um, you know, state that it requires two seconds of prep. It doesn't do a lot of damage. So it's okay, but yeah, I mean, you know, the ma the major issue here is that her shield, particularly her Montred shield, only gives 30% bonus now um, to other allied champions. So it's not this huge team buff that it used to be. Um, So can I see when is it? Okay, so it's at level 13 when she gets to the four seconds. So that doesn't resolve it. It doesn't make her more aggressive early. It doesn't um and it doesn't help her scale. It it's like a little bit of scaling. I mean, you will get some cooldown reduction when you're hitting stuff and moving. Like, yeah, it is uh, you know, 
it's 33% more cooldown reduction when you're landing and hitting spells and stuff. So, I mean, maybe. Maybe that's enough to bring her back. It's hard to sort of feel that out without, um, you know, playing her a few times to see. But I just think that if she's not in a position, if she's not in a meta where she can really bully a lot early on, then um, she's not going to be as strong. So, I mean, maybe. Sona is going to take a hit on this patch because of the changes to coin, which we'll talk about later. Uh, so maybe this opens up a space for her. If there's no Sona, and if Janna takes a hit, uh, then maybe you could come in and stick some damage early on. Because AD carries are trying to get away with not getting Doran's shield now, and um, they a lot of them do still get Warlord's Bloodlust, but they don't get Lifesteal items, they don't get Boy of the Ruined King um, first anymore, so... I mean, it's possible she could creep back into the meta, but... Uh, I just don't think so. Her her shield her shielding is just too weak. Her scaling is just way too weak. Like if you don't get ahead early, you're just gonna fall behind. I feel like Nami's just straight up a better version of Karma right now. She just has more CC. She has great bullying early game. She has a heal. Um, she scales better. I don't know. It's okay. I mean, may maybe it certainly helps Karma. I just don't think it's gonna help enough. Okay, Orn. This is a really, really big buff. Like, this is what I've been calling for for Orin to help him out for a long time, is change that W to max health. And then also get rid of some of these clunky, like, self-stun, like, cast times. And that's what they did here. So they did all of that. And they made uh, his E... Uh, they didn't take away the delay on when you go in for the headbutt, which is what I wanted them to do, but they did increase the hitbox. So that's similar in that it allows less counterplay. So now people can't just, you know, dodge away from you as easily as they used to be able to do it. So this is huge. Uh, and I've got Orin pulled up here. There were a couple of under-the-hood changes, too, that are just massive that I did not see documented anywhere. If this is accurate, and this looks accurate. Because um, I went back and looked. So... Okay, first, the documented changes that they made. The Bellows Breath being 20% um, of a target's max health on something that's an 8-second cooldown. Now, yeah, they do have to sit in it for the entire 2.5 seconds. Um, but that is huge. Especially if you keep in mind that it applies Brittle at the end. So if you get that um, attack on them after you slow them, uh, then that's going to deal an additional 7%. Uh, you know, 7 to whatever percent, 16%. So level 6, that's 10%. So you're basically doing 30% of their max health off of a W, and this is on an 8-second cooldown. And it can affect multiple people, don't forget that. So it does have 550 range. Um, and so in a team fight, you can do 20% of like an entire team's max health, which is huge. So that's like Tom Kinch-esque type of damage um, on your W, but it also has other utility on it where it's, it gives you a shield, it makes you unstoppable, and it can apply to multiple people. And it's much cheaper. I mean, Tom Kench's, you can't really... You have to prep for that, too. You have to land three autos before you can eat them. Uh, it has a longer cooldown, and it costs way more mana. So, you know, that's that's a lot. Like, that's really powerful. Same thing with Sejuani. Like, Sejuani has to stack up three of her ice, you know, things, and then, uh, then she hits people and does, you know, pretty good max health damage. But... So this is really, really strong, especially against tanks now. You're unstoppable also the whole time when you're doing that. So that means you can't be crowd controlled. So you can use it to dodge crowd control. Um, I think that's good. Now, I don't. I know he can't auto attack when he's doing this. I don't know if he can cast other spells or not, or if it's just like a self stun for two and a half seconds. Um, I've, I've played him like one time when he got released, so... We'll see, but that that is massive. That is a really, really big deal. That's going to help him just crush tanks top lane potentially. It's going to give him a lot of team fight presence. His damage was already like kind of okay, but this is huge. And they also lowered the mana cost on all of his abilities, or at least on a lot of them. This right here only being uh, fifty five mana is pretty nice. Um, I would say this is almost certainly what you want to max. Now, keep in mind also this applies to minions, I believe. Yes. So this is going to help him clear blue buff faster, red buff faster, just all the minions in the jungle faster. It's going to help him wave clear faster. It's going to help him be a bigger threat on Dragon and Baron. 
Like the the fact that this is changed to maximum health, I just cannot overstate how powerful that is versus current health. Um, it is a really, really big deal. So this is going to help him a ton in the jungle, and it's going to help him a ton, particularly against tanks in lane and with his wave clear. So I think this is unequivocally what you max first in like all positions is Orin. I already liked maxing this anyway. Some people are maxing Q top lane. That damage is just not high enough, I don't think. Um, it's decent, but that's that's the biggest change is his W. Um, now, yeah, they, they took it from, you know, whatever, 50, 25 current down to 20. That is a massive buff. Do not mistake it. That is not a nerf. That is a massive, massive buff. So that's a really big deal. And then that solidifies him as a respectable tank. Almost all respectable tanks have other tank breaking capabilities. They have max health damage in their kit somewhere. If you think of Sejuani, um, Cho'Gath, Orn, Jarvan doesn't, but Jarvan has so much other stuff. He's ridiculous anyways. Um, but most of them have max health and now he joins the club. Okay. Uh, terrain collision range. This is actually a really big deal, I think. So they gave him 50 extra range on his hitbox. That means he's much, much more likely to be able to hit people with a searing charge. Um, and that still does pretty decent damage. They did nerf the damage a while back. Um, I'm not I think this will be the second thing that you max after Bellows, and you get this last, I think, but it might depend on if you're jungle or top lane. I'm still not sure if he'll be, like, that greatest support. Maybe. I mean... I can't hear my mouth. Uh, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Like, you can spam this as kind of wave clear if you just want to, like, push your lane. I mean, he's okay. He's okay. I'm not, so I'm not really sure. This is definitely a buff, but I'm not sure if you would max this or this. I'd have to run the numbers a little bit more, but um, that's definitely going to allow you to hit more um, hit more knockups off of that, which is huge. And then um, the quality of life buff. Now, this is the kind of stuff that I thought they should be doing more of to him. I think they did some. They lowered the uh, cast time on his Q, which is great. And now um, there's no delay on his headbutt, so you can more cleanly aim where you want his ram to go so that's that's an awesome quality of life buff so that's just going to help him feel a lot less clunky um and just allow him to aim his uh call of the uh forge god a lot more so i think that's that's overall really really nice um it's going to give him a lot more uh reliability and uh execution now a couple of the really huge under the hood things that it's documenting here but i don't see that have been changed anywhere um is is this right here so it reduces the target's tenacity by 30 percent to 60 percent and empowers the next immobilizing effect okay per mark so it stacks up to twice the brittle this is massive and i have never seen this documented and this was not in the original i went back and looked at um my original orn video when i did orn impressions when he was first like announced on the pbe now, I was looking at his stats. This was not there. And I'm pretty sure I've never noticed this there. Among all of the Ornn buffs, they've buffed him like three or four times now. I have never seen this documented. So unless this wiki is wrong and someone just wrote this in here, I haven't looked in the game yet. But this is a huge buff. Huge buff. Because one of the major problems with Ornn <coughs> that I've mentioned sort of in the past is he has a very high level of execution to get the maximum damage out because... Both his Bellows Breath and his Call of the Forge God, they all apply Brittle. And it takes a, and the Forge God can hit twice, which means it can apply it twice. And so it was going to be really awkward. Um, I believe it applies it twice. Because it says it can hit twice. Dashes forward in the target direction. Once he collides... He headbutts it, sending stampeding in the new direction, knock up. It can damage enemies twice. Okay, so straight up it can damage him twice. So it can do up to 900 damage in theory. Oh, that's total damage. Okay, that's per hit. Then it can do up to, you know, that amount. Okay, so not as crazy. Uh, so up to 450. But the main thing is it applies two stacks of brittle. And it didn't used to be able to stack. I swear, I looked at the old PBE, it didn't used to be able to stack. And so the real issue was, okay, you can hit him twice with Call of the Forge God, but you can't proc this passive twice, unless it's like, you're calling in the Forge God, 
it hits somebody with it right as it's about to hit you, and then you, um, one of your allies hits them with a the crowd control effect, triggers the passive, and then you hit them again with Forge God, it puts it on them again, and then you auto attack them for the last one. So it was just like really convoluted how you could get multiple procs off of the ult, although you could, multiple procs of brittle. But now it can stack twice, which is amazing. So now you will get two stacks off Call of the Forge God, which doubles the damage here. So, you know, around level eight or so, that's 22% of their max health um, off of that now, instead of just the 11. So it's a lot more damage than it seems because of the stacking system. Um, that's particularly relevant with Bellow's Breath. And now you can call with a Forge God. Well, I think that's the main reason is, you know, if you get that double hit off call of the Forge God, then you're going to get that two stack whack um, now, which is a pretty big buff. Also, it takes off the tenacity whenever you do Brittle. I don't think this is going to matter that much, but, you know, if you get Brittle on somebody with Call of the Forge God and then your ally hits them with, like, a Sejuani ult and they have Merc Treads on, uh, they're going to be sitting in there for that full amount now instead of being able to get out of it early. So in, this isn't going to matter a lot of the time, but in corner cases, um, it could matter against people who buy Mercury Treads to some extent. So, um yeah, I think Orn's going to be a lot stronger now. So I'm not sure, like, just if he's going to squeeze other people out of the meta in any of these roles. Um, but he certainly could. I could see him going top lane as a matchup against tanks and being okay. Uh, I think he might get massacred by, like, Fiora and Jax and, like, other premier fighters top lane. But I think he could put on a pretty decent show against... Um, Maybe against someone like a Cho'Gath or a Maokai or a Jarvan. I'm not sure. Also, in the jungle, he could be pretty decent, too. We'll see. I mean, it's certainly a huge buff. I'm just not sure if it's enough to, like, completely pull him back into the meta. But it certainly will make him interesting. It'll pull him into the conversation. I'm just not sure, like, the situations where you would want him over other people. I guess he does have good area of effect damage and crowd control and just utility. I mean, maybe this will make him better as support. As a tanky support, he does have wave clear. Um, he does have some CC with knock up. The Forge God thing is pretty cool. We'll see. I think he might still be like one or two more buffs, or just like a uh, an itemization like meta change away from being <clears throat> like super good. But right now, I think he's definitely definitely viable. I think you'll see him. It's possible he's a top five jungler, top five um, top laner now, but. I'll have to see it in action, but that definitely helps him a lot. Now he's he's certainly viable. I think this will pull him into that 50% uh, range of being like a, a above average, like maybe average to above average, maybe even as high as good um, in those positions. Okay, uh, Tom Kench, pretty good buff. Um, this isn't going to matter as much for support, at least this first part. Because you're not going to be getting acquired taste and just like hitting people over and over and over again. This could be good for Top Tom Kinch, who used to be pretty oppressive. Um, so yeah, I mean it's definitely it's definitely pretty good, and it does come online faster. So it's not going to help you that much out in laning phase. I mean, where this matters the most is in laning phase, when you just get to sit there and just keep hitting people, especially top lane, where every time they try to go in for an auto attack, you can just hit them and just punish them. And it's tongue lash them and then just run them, chase them back to their tower and just keep autoing them. So it's not going to like completely crush the early game. Um, although taking it from 3% max health to, you know, 3.75 max health at level 1 is... Uh, Pretty decent. It's respectable. So that's okay. That'll help top lane Kench. Um, I don't think it's going to be enough. I think that he's still super susceptible to ganks. Um, it just doesn't have enough all-in like fight pressure when he hits level 6. But maybe. I mean, we'll see. Now, the Devour, uh, I think he'll still primarily be seen as the support, though. Uh, Devour Lockout. This is actually a pretty big deal, because one thing, when you eat your own ally... And I think it's I think it's short if you eat enemies, but if you eat allies, you can't spit them back out for two seconds. And I've had so many people that don't understand this, even people who used to be Diamond that I played with last year. Um, this duo guy was like, why, why don't you ever spit me out fast enough? Like, spit me out after you eat me and save me. I'm like, I can't. It won't let me. 
there's a lockout, and they just never believe it. They're like, whatever, dude. You know, um, that, I mean, they didn't say that, but I could tell they didn't believe me, and they just thought I was bad. I'm like, no, like, legit, there's a lockout. I can't spit you out for two seconds. And there it is. You can't spit them out for two seconds. Um, I don't think that's set. I don't think it mentions that on his um, toolkit. It's like one of those under the hood changes. I don't think. I mean, maybe. Yeah, it never says that. And that's why people don't believe it. They just think that. After one second, Devour can be recast, regurgitate. After the same delay. Okay, so people just like don't read this. But like, yeah, legit, it was two seconds. And this is a big deal because sometimes you just want to clear the crowd control and let your AD carry get back into the action to do damage. And this is particularly important with someone like Kogmar or Twitch because they have very um, very small windows of maximum damage. So, you know, if you eat a Kogmar after he turns on his W and people crowd control him, the longer he's in your stomach, the less damage he's doing. And he does most of his damage, obviously, when his W is up. Same thing with Twitch's ulting. And you have to eat Twitch to stop a crowd control. That's really bad because you're taking away... Um, his time to do his spray and pray, which only lasts for five seconds. So if you eat him, you know, you're taking away 40% of his potential, like, ultimate damage that he does, um, which is obviously really bad. So the fact that you can eat him and spit him out much faster to get back into the action, particularly with Twitch and Cog, means that he might be able to, like, you could maybe use him as a peel option for those champions. Typically, you, historically, you do not want to play Kench with them, specifically because if you eat them while they're doing their thing, they're, like, small window of superpower, um, then that's very, very bad. Because then you're basically crowd controlling them for two seconds. You know, they're not taking damage, but you're stopping your ally from doing damage for that amount of time. So taking this down to one second is a really big deal, particularly with those two champions. So now he becomes a good option, especially if Janna's banned, um, to protect them against heavy crowd control. So that's a really, really nice buff for support Tom Kench. I don't think it's going to be enough to like push him and make him like super overpowered. I think it's going to make him better at doing what he wants to do, specifically with those two ADCs, Twitch and Cog. Um, and the final one, uh, this is actually pretty good too, where, where is it here? Um, you're no longer locked out after you show up from Abyssal Voyage. So another annoying thing about Tom Kench is if you try to ult in to save somebody or you're showing up to a really hot situation, with your ult, then you can't press W for a second. And sometimes that's a really big deal because you can just ult in. If that wasn't there, you could eat somebody and just run away and just show up at the last second and save them. Now you can actually do that. You can abyssal voyage in. You know, if a fight's breaking out mid lane, you're bot lane, you're like, hold on, let me jump in and help that. And then you can just like really quick run up, rotate up there, and then be relevant. Like maybe just as Cinder's about to press her ult on somebody, you can just eat them immediately once you pop up. So. I think that's actually pretty uh pretty strong. So it's situational, but it does allow you to re like be more reactive with your Tom Kench ults instead of proactive. So typically, like you don't want to use Tom Kench's ult unless someone's going with you and you're going to be able to make an offensive play. But now you can use it more defensively to rotate and um, help help with rotations to uh, prevent people from getting killed immediately right when you uh, right when you show up. So pretty good overall. I don't think this is going to move him up a ton. It it does move him up some, especially that W change is a really big deal um, with certain ADCs in particular that are very strong right now. Um, so I think he'll still you'll still pick him in the situations where you want to pick him. I don't think this increases his strength anymore. It does create an interesting um, slight shift in the balance of power between Tom Kench and Morgana. Because both of them have sort of similar roles to some extent where they protect um, your AD carry from crowd control. Primarily, Morgana's is the black shield, of course. Tom Kench's is his W. Um, but Morgana does have the potential for initiation with her um, Q. And Tom Kench has other types of utility, um, such as his ability to stun people with his tongue. Um, his ability to rotate faster. So Tom Kench rotates faster. He's tankier. Um, and he could stick in combat and do more persistent damage than Morg. Morg has a skill shot bind, um, and it's just not quite as tanky as Kench's. So, I think this might... 
Morg's saving grace right now is that she uses Ardent Sensor a lot better than Tom Kinch does. But if they nerf Ardent Sensor a little bit more, and if they nerf uh, Coin just a little bit more, they did nerf Coin already, but if they nerf it just a pinch more gold-wise, uh, then Tom Kinch will uh, take Morg's slot as the premier anti-CC support. He's already like pretty close. I think it's like neck and neck right now with, after these buffs to Kinch with Morg. Um, so we'll see. I think it definitely helps him. Um, okay, Sterex is uh, interesting, but probably overall, um, I don't know. I guess I'm going to stop like before I do the support tier list this video just to keep it to about an hour, and then I'll do the tier list in a separate video. Um, Sterex, this is a really weird change to Sterex if you look at it. And this item has been in a really weird spot for a long time, and they have a ton of, um, a ton of, like, text here talking about it. Okay, so they're trying to help with crowd control, and they're trying to help, like, Trinity Force users. They just need to buff Trinity straight up, like, in s some way. But... Like, the big problem here is the increase in gold cost from 2,600 to 3,200 gold. That is so massive, and all you're getting off of that in terms of base stats. I mean, you're getting 450 health. Let me pull it up here. And see how it was altered. So the base increase in... Um, it's a unique passive and it goes from 30 to 50 base AD. Which is nice, but I think that it used to have... Um, bonus base attack damage. Increase to 30%. Okay, so you used to be able to go from... You used to be able to go to 60 total base AD while the passive was going. But now you always get 50. So that's kind of a wash, I think. Um, it's a little bit more consistent, but gold-wise, it's not that big of a deal to justify 600. And 100 or 50 extra gold is only, um, you know, like 125 extra gold efficiency or something. So you're basically paying like 450 to 500 gold. Um for the extra for this item and you're getting in exchange for that you're getting tenacity um as part of the passive but only when as part of the active rather or whatever when when your shield turns on but that only lasts for a small amount of time i think it lasts for up to eight seconds which is okay it's just like is it worth it to pay 500 gold for tenacity 30 percent tenacity that only kicks in when you're already have taken a lot of damage um I mean, it, it will see some play. People will try it. That's just, that's so expensive. Like, there's so many other items for 3,200 gold you could get. Now, the thing about increasing base attack damage versus just giving you AD or something like that is it helps out with Trinity. And they actually talk about that right here. What does that actually do? Um, that 50% base AD becomes 100% uh, of your base AD. So, basically, like, if you are... Um, and Irelia, or obviously people are going to be thinking about Irelia because you can get Mercury Treads plus Irelia's passive plus, um, you know, the new tenacity here. And I don't know what the number would be, but, um, you know, you're going to be looking at like 80% cool um, crowd control reduction. So you're going to be, um, you know, unstoppable, uncrowd controllable for the most part while this is going on, which is obviously a strong thing. Um, because I, I think they stack additively and not multiplicatively. Let me look at tenacity here. It doesn't affect suppression, which is, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Um, it stacks multiplicatively. Yes. So it does not stack additively. So you're not going to get the huge numbers. Um, now, 
So in other words, what that means is that, um, let's say that a crowd control duration is one second. If you stack this with mercury treads, that is 60% um, tenacity is what it would look like, but it does not reduce it to 0.4 seconds. It does 30%, so it takes it down to 0.7, and then it does 30% of the 0.7, which is like what, 2.1? Two, 2 so we take it down to 4.9, um, 4.9 percent, or a 0.49 crowd control duration instead of a 0.4, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's huge. That's a 25 percent difference. So it does not stack additively. So in other words, you cannot get to, um, you know, where something won't crowd control you. Okay, so you can't be fully unstoppable. It does some of the math right here and talks about stacking. You can get Elixir of Iron, which gives you another 25% uh, tenacity. So you can't become fully uncrowd controllable. And if you look at Irelia's passive, okay, it actually is tenacity. So it grant okay, so that stacks multiplicatively as well. So she gets, um, you know, by rank 11, 35% tenacity. So if you go, so that looks like 95%, right? So you get 30 from Mercs, 30 from um, uh, Sterex, and then uh, 30 from this, or 35 from this. Uh, we'll, just, we'll just keep it at 30 just to keep it interesting, right? It's at 6. So at level 6. So that's a 0.9. Okay, but it doesn't mean that it goes to point one. How that would work out mathematically? It would be you would do one times um, point seven because it takes off thirty percent times another thirty percent times another thirty percent. So it would take it down to point three four. So it would not knock off 90%, it would knock off 65% of the crowd control, which is good, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be completely unstoppable. So it's a nice effect, but it's not as overpowered as some of the all caps videos might make you see. I think I've already seen one video out there. It's like most OP champions on 7.2 or whatever, and it had a picture of Irelia on it. And I'm sure they're going to be talking about this item with Irelia, but it's cute. I just, I don't know. And, you know, it gives you the, uh, Did I take the item off? Or am I just blind? I think I took the item away. Okay, I pull it back up. Um, you know, the extra bonus that you get, it goes to, you know, 100% of your base AD. So if you have 100 um, AD base, then this is going to do, you know, an extra 20 or something like that. but once again like it used to do point or 60 percent when you were enraged but now it doesn't give you anything when you're enraged so it's like marginally when you're not enraged when the shield's up you're going to do just a little bit more damage and then when you are enraged you're going to get a little bit of extra tenacity which is nice but in exchange for that you're paying 600 gold the verdict i don't think it's worth it most of the time and the problem with this item and the reason that you haven't seen it in quite a while on most champions is because they change it to bonus health. So once again, they change it from base to bonus. Last time I was talking about AD, now I'm talking about health. That's usually really bad. Okay, so this is when Sterix got uh, punched in the face and you didn't see it very much after that. Was 7.9. Um, the shield strength changed to 75% of your bonus health from 30% of your max health. And that was the nail in the coffin, was a huge one. Um, the bonus base attack damage duration increased to 8 seconds from 3 seconds. So the bonus lasted longer. Um, the bonus damage went up, but it no longer gives you like a good shield. Because the, the, a lot of these champions, anyone that's going to want this item is not going to have a lot of bonus health, typically. Exception would be someone like Renekton. Now this item can be really good on Renekton because he has really high base damages. He likes... Um, now he doesn't get uh, he doesn't get any sheen items though, so he's not going to benefit as much from the base. But he does like base damages, 
Um, he does like the health, and he does get a lot of bonus health because of his ultimate. That counts as bonus health. So that actually does give him decent um, bonus health. So for example, you get 450 health off of this, and he buys Black Cleaver, which also gives a lot of bonus health now. So he gets you know 450 off of this, I think he gets uh, 400 off of Cleaver, whatever health that gives now. So that's like 950, and then his passive is going to give him like 600 bonus health. So it's going to take him up to like 1500, 1600 health. So this shield is going to you know be for like close to 1000 or something. So that would be really good. And tenacity is nice on him because he doesn't have any other tenacity. So it's not going to stack multiplicatively. It's just straight up 30% reduction. Um, and that's going to let him get in there and just do his thing more. So, you know, this could be a pretty good item on um, on Renekton. So you'd go like, as like a third item or something maybe. So you'd probably go Cleaver. You might go like Titanic Hydra, Cleaver, um, Sterex. So I, I could see something like that. So it, it's okay. I don't think it's going to shake up the meta that much. There's going to be some hype, all caps videos about Irelia. I still think Irelia is going to be relatively weak. And I think this just costs too much for what it is. I mean, Renekton may not even get it. He might get something else instead. You know, he might get like a Death Stance or something um, instead, which is kind of goofy, but I, I think it makes sense with his kit as like a third item. But anyways, um, I... I it's cute, but I just don't think you're going to see it a lot. Another case where this could be good would be uh, someone like Hecarim as like a third item or maybe a fourth item because he does get HP and he's a Trinity user. There aren't many people like that now that I can think of um, that want HP plus Trinity. I guess Jax could use it potentially um, because he gets Titanic Hydra. So maybe Titanic Hydra users can get it as like a third item because Jax goes Trinity, Titanic... And then I guess he could get this. That would help him with his Trinity procs, and that would make him unstoppable. So, okay, I guess it would be pretty good on Jax, too. Um, the problem with Irelia is she doesn't get, I don't think, unless there are new builds of Irelia, she usually doesn't get Titanic Hydra. But maybe you could go Trinity Titanic, and then um, that would give her more wave clear. That would give her auto attack resets. I mean, maybe. Maybe you would just go uh, Trinity Titanic, um, and then this item. But yeah, it could be good on Hecarim because, you know, he's going to go Trinity, um, Cinder Hulk, Warmogs, and then Sterix right there. So that would give him a pretty big shield, and that would help him with the tenacity. So I don't expect to see this item a lot. I could be wrong about this. If it does get used, it'll probably get used with um, Titanic users. So, uh, you know, Jax, Renekton. People will do it on Irelia. Maybe you switch over and go uh, Trinity, Titanic on Irelia. Um and you might see it on Hecarim if you see him. So it, it, it'll, be okay. it'll be okay. It'll be okay. Um, I'll say not weak necessarily, but overrated. And I could be wrong about that. Because now, because Jax will be strong on this patch. And that might be a, a good core item on him. And so will Renekton. So we'll see. We'll see. I could be wrong about that. It could be stronger. But I think at least it's not going to make I really overpowered. But it might get seen on Jax Renekton. That's my verdict. Uh, Joram's Fist, this is good. This is another buff to Jax, um, because he needs it. Or anyone else is going to get Titanic, like Jax, Renekton, you know, the same people that I just mentioned. And the reason is, it gives you more upfront cost, so you don't have as weak of a laning phase. So when you buy this item, because when you get Tiamat, um... When you get Tiamat, that's really strong. That's a really strong item. It helps you with your wave clear. It gives you an auto attack reset which is integral to some of these combos, especially with Renekton, to canceling his animation on his W. So Tiamat's really, really powerful. Um, but then uh, this item here is just not that efficient by itself typically, and so this is going to give it a little bit more efficiency early on. So I think it's a nice little buff. It means that you're not going to have that as weak of sort of... Uh, um, a power spike window when you get Tiamat and you're very strong and then you get this and you're like still kind of weak and then you get ti Titanic and you're a lot stronger. So overall pretty decent. Helps out Jax, Renekton, and crew a little bit more. Um, the coin changes are a pretty good nerf. Um, it needs nerf to its gold output. I think it needs to be nerfed to 30 gold per coin instead of 40. 40 is just so over the top insane gold generation or at least 35. But this is nice on the mana. So they're just doubling down on saying, okay, you're gonna get, you're still going to get rich off of this item. 
but you're going to have terrible mana management early on. It's so going from 10% to 6% is a really big deal. That's a 40% reduction. And the minimum going from 15 to 10 is another one that is uh, a pretty big deal. So we'll see. I mean, if you think about something that, uh, you know, if you have, I don't know, 30% of your missing mana, I'm trying to, let's say that you have 300 missing mana, right? So maybe your Sona, you've used half your mana in lane, um, you know, maybe around level six or so. Um, now, well, let's say it's even earlier than that. Let's say you're just like your Sona and you've got, you know, 500 total mana and you're missing, you know, 200 in lane. Now going from 10%, a coin would give you uh, 20 gold or 20 mana whenever you picked it up. And now it'll only give you 12. Um, and a lot of this is especially when you aren't that low on mana. So if you're only 100 mana low, um, you know, the minimum used to be 15 and now it's 10. So if you'd only used um, 100 mana and 10% of missing, you know, would be 10, you would get 10 mana back. Or you'd get 15 mana back before because the minimum was 15. So if you'd only used 100 mana, you get 15 back. Now you would only get... Um, uh, six back if you'd used a hundred because uh, the minimum is 10 now but now it's only giving you six instead of 10 so now you're only going to get six mana back so before you would get 15 if you'd used 100 mana because the minimum was 15 and the 10 percent was 10 but now you would only get six back so the difference in getting six mana back versus 15 mana back um i guess no the minimum's 10 sorry i'm it's late slash early whatever i've been doing this for uh, a little bit you would get 10 back so you would get 10 back because that's the minimum um instead of 15 and that adds up i mean if you think in the laning phase every time if you pick up these coins you lose um you know somewhere between 10 to 15 mana let's just say 12 on average depending on uh, you know how much mana you're missing if you lose 12 mana on average every time you do this and if you pick up you know, two of these coins per minute, that's 24 uh, mana per minute, you know, and if you're in lane for the first five minutes, man, it's like you're losing 120 uh, of your base mana off of this. And you might even get more than more coins than that in a minute. So that adds up quite a lot. I mean, it's like two extra spells. So you're definitely going to feel it on someone like a Sona or a Nami. Um, now, I'm not sure how that mana region stacks up. I mean, let's see. So uh, Spell Thieves, I think, gives, is it 25 mana? You can figure this out really quick. 25% of your base mana regen. Okay, so if you're someone like Sona, you're going to have uh, basically a 12 base mana regen. Uh, 12 mana per 5. And this is going to give you uh, 3. Yeah, 3 extra mana per 5. And so 3 mana per 5 times 12 would be 36 per minute. So this would generate 36 mana per minute for you passively. Um, on average. And then a uh, coin, if you get two blue coins, um, it depends on how low you are on mana, but at 6% to equal this, those two coins would have to be... Um, 18 mana each on average, which is a lot. Uh, so that means you'd have to be missing uh, 300 mana. So basically, if you're missing 300 mana and you get two blue coins per minute, which is like one blue coin per wave, which is very generous. Sometimes you don't get that. But if you get two of these, then the mana regen would only equal out if you're missing 300 mana, which is a lot. That's like seven. if you're just constantly floating around as Sona with like 75% of your mana pool empty, um, then this would give you the benefit. But if you have any more than that, then Spell Thieves is going to give you more mana regen. So, you know, I think that... And Spell Thieves just got buffed, so we'll talk about that too, because these items in conjunction are kind of... Um, you know, that's how you want to think of them, because they, they compete with each other with a lot of utility supports. 
So getting the extra 5 AP is a huge deal. I mean, it's an extra 110 gold at level 1, basically. It's like you get gifted 110 gold to start with this item now. Um, and I'm pretty sure this gives 10% CDR now, right? Yeah. And you get 50% mana regen. Now, don't forget, this also scales with um, uh, Athene's Unholy Grail also. Because Athene's Unholy Grail gives you extra AP based on your um, based on your mana regen. So coin doesn't count towards that. But now, if you go Eye of the Watchers, which I still think only gives 50, right? It used to give 100% mana regen. Now it only gives 50. But if you go, if you finish Eye of the Watchers... Um, then that would be an extra 10 AP on Athene's Unholy Grail if you choose to get that on someone like Sona or Nami. So that's not bad. It's pretty good. You know, 10, um, 10 extra AP is roughly equal to like an extra 200 gold worth of value. So you're getting some nice value there. You're getting 200 gold off of that. Um, that's pretty decent. Now, it says this gives you 20 ability power instead of 15. I thought that the buff was only to the base item. Now, Watchers only gives you 35, so that hasn't changed. But this looks like it's giving you an extra 5 here as well. I mean, that's very gold efficient. That's 112 gold efficient on a gold item that generates gold. So that's that's a really nice item. Um, I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to see. I mean, I think that... I think you might want to get Spell Thieves now on Sona and Nami again. Because that extra 5 AP is going to help you hit a lot harder, and lo you're losing out on a lot of mana regen. Like I said, you're gaining extra mana regen off of Spell Thieves now, unless you are... Um, unless you're missing 300 mana the entire time during your laning phase, you're actually getting more mana regen now off of Spell Thieves. So... Yes, you are giving up some gold later, uh, for sure. So you have to decide if that's worth it. But you do get the extra, you know, 35 AP, which is a big deal. I mean, 35 AP is, uh, it's like 700 gold worth of stats or something. So you're not really going to fall that far behind in terms of gold. You're going to get a faster power spike around um, 14 minutes, 15 minutes or so once you complete... Um, once you complete the uh the eye of the watchers but and then you might start falling behind later on sona can proc it kind of easily you can continue to proc the tribute with sona because you have such a long range on your q you can just kind of wander around and just like press q and hit people for those procs if you need to um it's a little bit harder with nami but i think i think that you should probably go spell thieves again on nami and sona now i think with janna i don't know maybe you should do it as janna too because janna does have a longer attack range now so you can actually attack people to proc this in lane that was one of her huge problems before why she never got spell thieves was because um you could never really proc it because you only had 450 attack range but now that she has uh this extra attack range maybe you want to get this as well um and don't forget this does damage on hit. Not only do you get an extra 10 ability power, but you get an extra 10 damage every time you auto attack somebody up to three times. So it does quite a significant amount of extra damage early on to people. And now that people are running less and less uh, Doran's uh, shield in lane, this could be really useful. So yeah, you might even want to get it on Janna now because you can actually proc it with her autos because her autos aren't complete garbage now. Hmm. And Janet obviously does scale really well with AP. We'll see. I mean, how much gold? So you would get... When you get to Frost Fang, you get an extra 15 gold per hit. So if you can rush this in the laning phase... And this does extra damage to towers, so it helps you push a lot faster. In the laning phase, three times every 30 seconds, you can get 45 gold per second. Now that is only equal to roughly like one coin one gold coin per minute off of the wave so you're not going to be getting as many as much gold most likely even if you hit every single frost fang proc um so you're still going to be losing some money 
it's a tough call. It's a tough call. I would say if you are in a lane where it's early aggression and you think you can really leverage this extra AP and this extra on hit and you really want that extra mana that you're going to get now off of Spell Thieves relative to coin, it's not extra mana, it's just you're not losing as much as you lost with coin, um, then it might be worth might be worth so if you're a sona lane and you feel like you can bully out janna early on and just you know maybe force them out of lane because if you force them out of lane just one time uh early on and let's say you force their ad carry you're able to pressure them much harder and you know you get their ad carry to fall behind like six maybe even 10 cs like 10 cs is about 200 gold so if you think about your ability to deny with more aggression early on with frostfang um, if you can force them back and force them to miss, you know, 10 CS over the course of your laning phase, then that's 200 gold there. And then you're getting like 650 gold off of, um, I, the watchers, uh, extra procs, 850, 900 gold. Now, you know, coin is still going to surpass you, but not until probably, you know, 27, 30 minutes, something like that. So you're still going to start losing out in the late game to coin. Um, but you're going to have a, a much bigger window of early game power spike um, with this, if you can deny more, which you should be able to deny more because you're going to have more ability power on hit, and now you're going to have superior mana regeneration with this item. So it's all about what you do with it, though. You can't sit there and chill. If you're going to get this item, you have to attack. Like, you have to get up there and pressure them and force them to miss CS or force them to back early. So, uh, interesting item. Uh, I do like the choice. I do think it's going to be uh, a little bit better. Now, if you're Janna and you're in a passive lane, you know, if you are like with Twitch and you just can't get aggressive, right? So like maybe you're Janna and you're paired up with Twitch and they have something like, um, you know, Caitlyn, Sona or something like that. You're probably still better off going coin because you're just not going to be able to be that aggressive in lane. So if you can't pressure, if you're just going to be on the losing side of the lane then you probably still want to go coin but if you can pressure if you can deny cs if you can apply um just extra harassment early on with this frost fang and really leverage that five ability power in the on hit um then you probably should go frost fang so this is going to confuse a lot of people because they're going to be constantly asking me should i go frost fang or should i go you know ancient coin or whatever and i'm going to say well it's going to depend how aggressive can you be in the lane and so that's good for the game from a strategic standpoint because now these have clear identities. This is early aggression. This is a late game payoff. But it's going to force people to think a bit more critically about their compositions and just what their team needs. So it's going to create uh, some confusion with people. Uh, even right now, I'm confused. Like I said, I, I'm not exactly 100% sure which champions this should replace for which, but I think it makes it certainly a lot more competitive and interesting. And I think the key here is, can you be aggressive early or not? If you can, run Frostfang. If you can't, run Coin. Okay, and then we'll do top five for the roll, and then I will do the uh, tier list in a separate video because I don't want to go much longer than, you know, like an hour or so for these. Hour, 15 minutes is, is pushing it. Um, so I think that... Actually, you know what? I'll just... I'll save this. I'll just give you the TLDR right now, and then... Um, when you watch the tier list video, I'll start with this and I'll talk more about why some of these shifts. So top lane, I think uh, Jarvan's still number one. I think Cho's really good. I think Jax is really good, Fiora. And I think that Renekton is going to make a comeback too. It's going to be very strong. Um, early game bullies are just getting a lot more powerful now. And especially with these buffs to uh, Jarvan's Fist, which is part of Titanic, I think that's really good. And the fact that he is potentially one of the best Sterix users, if that ends up being an item that is a bit stronger than I think as maybe a third item, then he would definitely fit the bill for that. Orin is another one who could sneak in up there potentially. I'm not entirely sure about all of his matchups. I think he'd still have a hard time against a lot of these champions, but maybe against something like Cho, he could be a decent pick. I really don't know. But I mean, Orin could be a presence top lane. I'm not entirely convinced that he'll be better than any of these five, but I think that he could certainly work his way up there. Also, don't forget that a lot of the tanks got nerfed as well. A lot of the standard tanks over the last like three patches, they've nerfed Bramble Vez, they nerfed um, Cinder Hulk, they've nerfed almost every tank item in some way. So that's what's opening up a space for things like Jackson Fiora top lane. But the mega tanks are still so strong that they're still going to have a huge presence.
Okay, mid lane hasn't really changed that much. We've got uh, Cassidy and Talia. I moved Azir up a little bit. I I was one of the few people that was saying this was going to be a big buff for Azir, that he was actually going to be in the meta and really strong. And I think that's playing out. I think we'll see him competitively as soon as Worlds is over and people can start playing again. Um, you know, on the new patch, pros will start playing again on the new patch. Uh, I think we'll uh, we'll definitely see some more Azir, assuming he doesn't get changed and the preseason doesn't hurt him too much. Um, but yeah, he's super strong right now. Cassidy is still number one, very reliable, excellent anti AP. Talia still super strong. Oh, I need LeBlanc in here. I forgot about LeBlanc. I think LeBlanc's still really good. Um, I guess I'll leave LeBlanc out because she's kind of a specialist champion. She's extremely powerful, but only if you're really, really good with her. So I guess I'll leave her out because I think that all these champions are easier to play than LeBlanc is. But I think that LeBlanc could be as high as number one or number two if you're really good on her. So I think she deserves kind of a special mention. Um, there's a lot of good mid laners. Though. I mean, Echo's really good right now too. Um, TF can be really good. Twisted Fate, Anivia can be really good. So there are a lot of really... Like, that's one of the most balanced lanes right now is mid. I think there are a lot of really strong things in mid. Um, Lucian's still like, okay, Zed's okay, sort of, kind of, Talon's okay. Um, but yeah, Azir's really strong, uh, Syndra and Galio. I like Galio there because if you just need a tank slot in mid lane, he just has excellent push and roaming. So I think if, for example, you have a Jax top and a Kane jungle and you need a tank on your team, you could run Galio middle and be really strong. Uh, as far as jungler goes, I still think J4 is number one in the jungle. I think Sejuani's super good. I think uh, Ezreal's for real. He is really, really strong right now um, in the jungle. He just has an extreme amount of early power and great scaling. I mean, Ezreal could deserve to be number one, honestly. Like, he's that good right now. And I made a whole video about it if you're curious. Just check out uh, my channel and you'll see the video about why I think jungle Ezreal's really good. And it's it's kind of playing out exactly as I predicted it. Now, I was a hater on jungle Ezreal for about a day or two. And then I actually researched it, thought about it a bit more, made a video about it, and changed my mind. And I thought that he was really strong and i still do in the jungle and a lot of that has to do with his itemization because he doesn't have to get tier of the goddess when he's in the jungle it gives him a much faster power spike um i think that ramus is someone who's just a solo queue terror very very good uh he has excellent early game ganking and he's really good against uh other ad's that are out there so you know as jackson fiora become more popular he's super good against them um and he's obviously good against most ad carries so i think that He's a little more gimmicky than someone like J4 or Sejuani. Like he, there is more counterplay to him, but the fact that Janna's getting banned all the time helps him out so much because he's so great against other enchanters. Because Sona can't really do anything if he comes rolling up. Rakan can't do anything about him. Um, <clears throat> most other enchanters can't do anything about him to stop him from rolling up without putting themselves at extreme risk. So he's excellent against enchanters, and he's excellent against low mobility 80 carries like... Um, like Draven, like Twitch. Uh, Zaya can kind of get around it, but not really that well. So I think this is a, this is a great meta for Ramus. Uh, and then Malachi. I think Malachi is still respectable. I think he's still strong. He has good wave clear, excellent CC. Um, you know, I, I still think that he's pretty good in the jungle, just not as good as he once was. As far as AD goes, I think Draven is number one right now. I mean, Draven is always one of those champions that if you're really good with him, he could be very relevant, but he just does so much damage. He punishes so hard early in solo queue, um, and people are starting to play more squishy champions. So, you know, you're starting to see those Jaxes, those Fioras, um, Talia, Cass had done a little bit more. Even in the jungle, I don't have him mentioned here, but people are playing squishier junglers now. I'm seeing more Kha'Zix. I'm seeing more um, Kane. Kane is super popular right now. He might deserve a spot in the top five, but I still think these five are probably better overall than Kane is. Um, so you're starting to see squishier stuff. People are just not playing tanks as much. I mean, if we go through and look... Um, look at some of my stats recently. I mean, a lot of teams will have just one or maybe two tanks. Tank supports overall are pretty weak. So you're definitely not seeing tank supports, but even in other lanes. Um, like, look at this game here. This is indicative of sort of what's happening in this meta, right? Um, my team had no tanks. Their team had no tanks. People were just playing all of these kind of squishy, like, 
damage champions. Now, are those the best champions right now? I don't think so. I think people just are tired of tanks. So they just don't want to play them anymore. Um, they have been nerfed some, and they just feel like they just can't carry as hard, because that's what everyone says. Oh, you got to play a carry role. You know, you can't play tanks. you got to carry really hard. Um, I don't agree with that, obviously. Uh, but that's just that I think that's the kind of mentality that's keeping people from playing tanks. So if you look here, um, you know, the enemy team here, they had Scion who went full lethality Scion. So even people who are playing things that are like tanks just aren't even building tank. I mean, Yorick is kind of built some tank there, sort of kind of, but no one else had any kind of defensive stuff there. Um, and then here, like we had the Sejuani, they had. These champions probably aren't building tank. Nar, not really. Um, I mean, Galio, yes. I mean, we, we just slaughtered them. They didn't even really have a game that game. Um, yeah, this one, Singe, Renekton. Like, it's just like very light tankiness most of the time. This one, we had Malachi. They had no tanks. Like, Shivana's building all damage. Uh, Pantheon's building all damage. So the point here is that when there aren't tanks, that's when Draven runs wild because he just like two shots people. He has a problem against tanks. He can break them, but he doesn't he doesn't break them as fast and he doesn't have as much mobility to walk around them. Like he doesn't want long fights. Draven wants the fight to be over quickly because he doesn't have a lot of mobility. He doesn't have a lot of utility. He just has a ton of damage. So being able to end fights quickly, just blow somebody up immediately is a huge boon to Draven. If he gets a tank in his face, it, he can have a really hard time dealing with it. So now that people aren't running tanks as much, he's super strong. He just annihilates squishy champions. He kills other AD carries. So he just completely runs people over. Um, and if you have a Draven on your team, the Nami, I think, is a very, very good compliment right now. We'll talk about Nami when I talk about the support tier list. I moved her up 14 ranks. I think she's extremely good right now uh, because of the way this meta has been shifting. Um, but Draven, super strong. Uh, that's why he's got my number one spot for solo queue. You won't see him in competitive, but for solo queue, especially like a good Draven player. Very good right now. I think that Twitch or Caitlyn rather is also extremely powerful. If you haven't played against new Kate, you don't want to play against her. She's so strong. Those traps deal a ton of damage. She has a lot of poke. She just has so much pressure early on. It's just virtually impossible to stop her from taking your tower, you know, in the first five to eight minutes of the game if your jungler does not come down there and camp so um she's very good she's just like good old kate i mean and like the new itemization for her like people think that hurricane hurts her it doesn't really matter that much like she can still go infinity edge static shiv uh rapid fire cannon and do a ton of damage and rapid fire cannon combines very well with her new ability to headshot towers where now you can headshot get that rapid fire damage from really really far away and so she's even better at sieging. Her traps hurt even more than they used to. She has a stronger early game. She got her wave clear back. She's just a complete nightmare. So Caitlyn is awesome right now. And now that people are also transitioning into building or like playing more of these heavy damage champions in other roles, then she, you don't need the hyper carry as much in solo queue as you used to, right? If you have a zero on your team, um, if you have people playing things like Fiora again, you have people playing things like Cassiopeia, um stuff like that now then it's okay that you don't have the hyper carry twitch or the hyper carry tristana on your team anymore like you can use caitlin just for that sieging potential just for that early game harass and it's going to be all right that you don't scale as well at the end game she still does a lot of damage but if you're just sitting there auto attacking she's not going to do as much as like tristana or twitch late game but that's okay because other people are playing lots of damage champions similarly she's not that great against tanks um because she attacks very slowly so she kind of like draven wants to two shot people she wants to roll up do her headshot just completely bust someone out or if they get crowd control drop a trap on them and combo them you know 100 to zero so that's what she wants. She is a burst caster type of AD carry, very similar to Draven. Um, and except they're both crit strike users rather than someone like uh, Jen or Varus, who historically are burst casters as well, but they would use lethality. <clears throat> so those two in particular, because they are the early game bullies, because um, you know they can leverage that early game power people aren't building door and shields all the enchanters have been kind of hit a little bit in terms of um janna sona um and a couple others with the coin nerfs and direct nerfs in the case of janna um 
then this allows for a little bit more aggression early game, and these are the two best early game aggressive uh, AD carries right now. Uh, Twitch, still super powerful. Twitch is still Twitch. He can go invisible if he gets three items, or sometimes even two items. He just completely obliterates the enemy team, so... He is very strong, but he has hard matchups against Caitlyn and Draven in particular. And because I think both of those have stepped up a lot, um, excuse me, then I think Twitch is going to have some problems. So he's really strong if you can get through the laning phase, but one of his core partners in crime, Janna, has been nerfed a lot. And then I think that other healers like Sona have been nerfed with his coin buff in lane. So if he, um, if he gets behind early it's going to be harder to catch up than it used to be. And there's more likely he's going to get behind because he's not going to have as much um, healing and shielding from his supports. If you do want to play him, I highly recommend either taking Relic Shield or Doran. It's almost a must on him. Um, Zaya is another one who is still really, really strong. She's being played a lot at Worlds now. Um, similar to Twitch, she can get bullied out early by Draven and Kate. She does have decent burst damage. She does have some utility. But her 525 range really hurts her for trading, especially against Caitlyn. Caitlyn can bully her out um, big time early on. Um, so she's still good. She's still really good. She does require a bit more skill than some of these other ones. Draven is the highest skill because you have to constantly catch those axes. But um, she does require more skill than someone like a Twitch or a Tristana, most likely. So um, there is more margin for error there, which is going to bring her down just a little bit. But... Overall, I think she's really good. If you have a Rakan on your team, she might jump as high as number two or possibly even number one. Uh, so it, it just kind of depends. But I think she is still really good. She's good if there, if there are a bunch of divers and it's going to be a really long fight. So she likes the tank. She wants there to be people trying to dive her. She wants fights to last for, you know, 10 seconds so she can stack up all these feathers on the ground. So, you know, since we're shifting away from the tanks towards burst scenarios... She's not going to be able to stack her feathers as much, and that's not going to make her as strong right out the gates as someone like a Draven, Cater, Twitch, which is why she's fallen a little bit, because we've moved out of that tank meta. And then, Well, I said this was going to be the TLDR, but now here I am explaining everything. Um, I can't help it. I love to analyze. I love to explain. And then Tristana, um, still really good, still really safe. Uh, she had a couple of direct nerfs to her, and Caitlyn is back. And Caitlyn just massacres her early game. And Draven does too. So similar to Zaya, Trist wants longer fights. She wants longer games. She wants to be able to scale up, get to three items, get her really long range. And she wants to be able to pop her attack speed and just keep attacking people. Um, she could deserve to be up even higher than this. It's tough to say. All five of these are very powerful. I just put Draven and Kate up there because I think the early game is starting to matter a lot more than it used to because of different shifts, particularly the removal of tanks and the introduction of assassins. Because you're not going to have, you know, with Trist, if Talon comes up at you or Kane just comes out of a wall at you or something, you know, I guess you do have safety where you can blow him back and jump away, but it just feels like she can get muscled out pretty hard by Draven and Kate early on. Um, but she's still really good. Uh, Kalissa's another one who could be on here. She's the kind of the third uh, really good early game aggression champion. I just feel like I don't know. Callista is a lot harder to play. I don't know. She's just weird. She's different. Like, she is very difficult to play, very difficult to execute. Um, but she is very good with um, Ardent Sensor, Boy of the Ruined King, uh, Hurricane. But she just doesn't scale as well as some of the other ones. So, Caitlyn still, once she gets those three items for crit, she's really strong. So is Draven late game. They can, you know, two-shot people. Kalissa is never going to be two-shotting people. She wants longer fights. She wants to be able to stack up her Rens, um, her Ren stacks. Um, so, uh, you know, that that's her issue is she wants longer fights. Kind of like Zaya, kind of like Twitch, or kind of like Zaya, Tristana, Kalista. She wants longer fights. Um, and those, that's just not happening as much lately. There's just a lot more skirmishing, faster fights, people are getting blown up because there's aren't as many tanks running around. So, anyways, that's going to be it. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I really wanted this to be an hour, but it ends up being like an hour and a half. Like I said, I'm going to do a separate video for the support tier list, uh, so be sure to stay tuned for that. And thank you very much. I'll see you next time. Have a good day.